thank you very much for the nice introduction and perhaps I have to tell you why we are here and the reason why we are here is not my fault, I want to say it's the, it's the, um, uh, what is the achievement of my colleague uh, Stefan Rotes, which is also here, because he uh, managed that we get a DAAD project to develop um, a monitoring system for, for biodiversity in Luzon. And we are now exploring with uh, people from the Institute of Biological Sciences uh, how to make some collaboration. And within these collaborations, it uh, gave me, told me that I have to give a talk about LIDAR. Oh, sorry, it's wrong. About LIDAR. Uh, and before starting my talk, I have also to say to uh, note that I'm not an expert in remote sensing, I'm a user remote sensing and I will show you say my point of view how can remote sensing help to understand a little bit about the distribution of biodiversity and perhaps uh, I got just uh, uh, a note what Philips mean it has nothing to do with the Philippines it is some kind of a duke or a ruler or a king uh, in, from Germany who well, he founded our university already in the middle of the 16th century. So we are a quite old university. Um, I think it's better to... Now it's better? Uh, we are a quite old... I have to cry like that. Um, we are a quite old, uh, uh, old university and uh, we have almost all departments of natural sciences, humanity, philosophy, and also medicine. Well, to give you a short flavor about the work we are doing as a department and some kind of introduction uh, to the use of remote sensing in biodiversity research, I want to give you one of these pictures of our recent research results. We are interested in broad patterns of biodiversity. And this gives you a, let, let's only concentrate on the left hand side of this figure. We are interested in the distribution of traits of species. And here we have a very simple trait. We measure the darkness of the color of uh, the animals and simply average the color across all species living within one grid. And we get a very, very uh, uh, clear pattern here if it's red. They are all white, or almost white, or most of them are white. If it gets blue, almost of them getting most of the species getting down. So we have a latitudinal gradient of white communities to dark communities from south to north. And of course, it has something to do with thermal regulation because they are dark and can easily grasp information or grasp energy out from the environment to increase the body temperature and then to get the to increase your activity and you see this works for butterflies, this works also for uh, dragonflies and having such interesting patterns, spatial patterns in biodiversity, we need some explanation. For explanation we need data covering the whole uh, area, for example here is a whole area of the world. It's almost not possible or without uh, uh, getting data from remote sensing. What is remote sensing? Well, when you want to define remote sensing, then most people would not think about some of the methods. Because remote sensing can be defined as any method which has no direct contact with the object. So remote sensing is also collecting water and then sequencing the DNA floating in the water and identifying species by R coding. That's one possibility. Of course, uh, radio tracking, sound recording, camera tracks are also some kinds of remote sensing. And, and I will come back later. Most people would think about remote sensing as something which comes from the air. But this is also remote sensing. And remote sensing has done a huge uh, technical advance during the, large, during the last 10 years and I only want to give you a smell or a taste about what, is, what we can achieve now with radio tracking and satellite uh, GPS. These are people um, uh, analyzed black kites. Black kite is a raptor uh, living in, in, in Europe with all distributed all over the world and they use radio tracking to monitor the migration route 
roots of this raptor to speak to Africa. And they only bought it for young individuals and for mature individuals, right? Or these individuals which have not yet bred. The yellow one are breeding individuals. And you can see with radio tracking combined with satellites, you can uh, get the really nice data. What they found out, for example, is that young species or young individuals use a much broader migration corridor than adult individuals. And this is seen here, when you look at the repeatability, this is a black one, the repeatability means how close the migration road in the next year is to the migration route of the year before, and it increases considerably. So, speech or individuals seem to learn how to migrate from, from uh, along uh, the migration route, and this is of course connected to mortality and all these things. Such kind of behavioral studies would have been impossible 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and are only possible with the developments now, and the technical developments now in remote sensing. But let us now come back to our job, remote sensing and biodiversity. And when most people talk about remote sensing, they are thinking about drones, uh, thinking about uh, 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 airplanes, and of course, satellites. And one has to understand that remote sensing can be passive with optical sensors which simply measure the reflectance of the surface. And along the electromagnetic spectrum, there are wavelengths here, spot is wavelengths, here is some rough estimates of the reflectance, here are some that should be outdated this figure, here are some uh, sensors on, on satellites, and you see that most of these sensors measure the reflectance in the range between 400 and 800 nanometers, that is in this device in the range. And of course, or besides these passive systems, we have also active system, and LIDAR is one of the active system, and uh, in a few minutes I will explain what we have to understand of an active system. What I only want to mention here is that this reflectance gives a lot of information on the surface which can be used as proxies, not as direct estimates, as proxies to model in statistical models biodiversity. There's not an understanding of the process, but simply some kind of, of, of a modeling exercise to predict biodiversity along spatial, uh, uh, across huge extents. And then perhaps some people might ask me, why do we need such spatial models or such spatial representations of biodiversity? And I would answer that maps of biodiversity are important in basic and applied ecology, and of course, all conservation managers use these maps for making decisions. We had a very, very simple explanation of meetings in a national park in the southeast, uh, southeast, yes, southeast of Germany in Bavaria. And I'm a Bavarian, but it's the most peculiar tribe in Germany. And perhaps my language, you will uh, notice from my language that you are very peculiar. Um, and the red points, if a habitat suitability of this nice forest birds. It's a paper cake. It's a highly endangered piece in Europe, highly endangered bird species. We get these red points. It's high habitat suitability. The, uh, the blue ones show low habitat suitability. And of course, for the planning, for example, for hiking routes in the national park, it's important to know where are the high or the habitats with the high. Uh, the areas with a high habitat suitability for this endangered species. So such maps are important. The problem is with such maps is sampling of biodiversity is costly. For birds, it's very easy. But if you want to measure, for example, biodiversity of insects across the whole scale of this um, national park, it's about 100 kilometers the diameter here, it is not only costly in the sense that we have to sample data outside in the field and to identify the samples, it's, only co it's also costly because we have not the experts in taxonomy which can determine or which are willing or have the time to identify species we are collecting. So sampling of biodiversity is costly, therefore mapping of biodiversity using proxies from remote sensing would be an option to extrapolate from samples to a larger extent. And the point is, uh, remote sensing provides data of a large extent and a considerable fine grain. 
I mean, the resolution is very, very uh, uh, small. And this is one also one further problem when combining biodiversity with remote sensing. This gives you here the resolution. It's called grain of the data. The resolution, for example, of data you can get from remote sensing. And the resolution is sometimes one kilometer, 100 meter, and when you use modern system, you can go even below one meter. When you look at the biodiversity data available in uh, public data banks, you see that the resolution is sometimes, well, let's, let's go here and see, for 50 kilometers and even less. So there's a gap here, what we call a knowledge gap between what we can achieve with uh, remote sensing and what is available with biodiversity data. That's the reason, and we will see in my, my examples that we need always field sampling of biodiversity to use remote sensing for mapping of biodiversity. That's a very, a very important point. And for those which have no idea what remote, uh, what LIDAR is, I give you here a very user-friendly and a very easily digestible introduction. It's simply an active system. The active system means she's not measuring the passive reflectance of the surface. So there's its own, own source of a beam, and what, what is measured is the reflectance of this beam, and thereby you can get, you get a good representation, now you see, a good representation of the surface. And that's an active system, you cover the 3D information, and this gives you some kind of surface uh, of the area, and of course this surface is the habitat of a lot of animals and a lot of plants, and this can be used for modeling biotools. And these sensors can be mounted on, on planes, can be mounted on, even can be terrestrial, can be on the air, can be on the space. And the most important say, uh, resolution is called the footprint of the space, that's the diameter of the size uh, of the one beam, of one laser beam, and it might be to give you some kind of an impression might be in the order of magnitude of 20 centimeters when you use um, airborne laser, it might be something like 50 meters or something when you use information um, from the space. And of course it's not enough to have only the 3D information, you need, uh, uh, besides the laser and the receiver, of course you need information about the location, in, uh, of, of, the, of the plane or the, or the satellite this is done by a GPS and of course we have also to measure uh, the offset measurements when the plane is moving so they can, you can calculate all the disturbing factors of the plane or of the, of the measuring devices and what, you, what is returning are data about uh, the reflectance they can be from the surface they can be from the vegetation of the canopy and from this you have to pro process the information, you, process, you, you, you get a model, statistical model of the terrain, of the surface, and then you get also a model about the reflectance of the vegetation, and this gives you a good impression about the bushes and the trees and how things look. And this can be used for modeling. That's simply the introduction uh, to LIDAR. And perhaps uh, a short uh, uh, something a short, a short uh, excursion into the history. LIDAR was invented soon after uh, the invention of the LIDAR. And perhaps, of course, the first use of LIDAR in, in geography or in, in natural science was by the, by the US for measuring the clouds from the bottom, uh, from the surface. And I think people get not aware about LIDAR is one of the, within one of the Apollo missions because one of the missions measured the moon surface using LIDAR. And when you look at the fabrications on LIDAR here from 1960 to now, or in the last year, now every year about one, more than 1,000 of papers using LIDAR are appearing in the international literature. And when you look a little bit more into detail, about, about uh, what's published about LIDAR, you see that only from this 1,000 year, only 14% or 15% about vegetation and conservation at 2% or biodiversity only, also something about 2% and ecology, let's say, let's say all, all things about 2%. So 
Autogether, perhaps 20%, 80% of LIDAR publications about technical things, and only 20% about uh, biodiversity. And this biodiversity issue is also skewed, skewed to vegetation. So it's underused in the ecological community. Right. Perhaps I can convince you uh, that might be of some interest to use LIDAR in biological research, but and hopefully also convince you that one has to be very careful in using it. It's not a magic bullet which can express anything. But first, um, a short uh, um, approach that we have done to convince you that we take a measure something meaningful in this LIDAR. In this project, we work on bats. And in Germany, we have three kinds of bats. One are open foragers, one are edge foragers, and one are closed, closed vegetation foragers. So foraging, they are foraging in areas with almost no space filling by some vegetation, and these closed uh, foragers need dense vegetation. And then we use a simply terrestrial LIDAR system to measure the reflectance of the vegetation within uh, a circle of 20, uh, 20 meters. And this is how the pictures we can get for the the data you can extract from the reflectance. This is an open foraging or an open uh, system with only 2% scattered from the vegetation. Here are forests with a more closed canopy with about more than 50% of reflectance uh, from the vegetation. And when you plot here the mean number of animals you can see in the various plots with the various, uh, this, uh, or say the other way around here, we ordered our plots from a low reflectance, this is a 2% plot here, this is a 50% plot here, and 65% plot here. When you measure, when you measure or you plot the activity of the pets along this space filling of the vegetation, here labeled green vegetation density, you see what you expect. And you see that the open space foragers go down, the edge forests are in the middle, and the close vegetation for, uh, foraging species are in the dense forests. So this was not the, the aim of LIDAR was not here to estimate um, um, or the, the first aim, but I hope that this convinces you that this LIDAR data, very simple LIDAR data, can present meaningful information about the habitat of certain species and even information which is also uh, perceived by the animals itself, so information from the pets point of view. <coughs> now, let's go to the, space. the next step is to the spatial representation of animals. What I've already showed you, or already tried to convince you, is that we have no data on biodiversity and the spatial resolution necessary for uh, a mapping biodiversity for life sciences. So the only point, the only possibility is we have to make sounds. So let's, let's, we have to distribute samples across the area where we can, where we want to make biodiversity. Then, of course, we sample the whole area and see sampling points. I do not want to mention the strategy. How do we distribute the sampling points across, across the area? It's a field by its own. But we are sampling everything with LIDAR. And then we need some kind of statistical models where we use the variables derived from LIDAR to predict some ecological variants variables collected at sea sampling points by some kind of sampling device, either by hand sorting, uh, hand sampling, by pitfall trap. So here it's a flight interception trap. It's simply two pieces of gas and the insects flying go to the gas and drop down into uh, the sounding uh, wire. So we need such statistical models. And here it looks like a very simple linear model, but it is not like this. No, I will not go into detail about statistical modeling. These models can be very complicated. They can go from simple generalized linear models to high compli or to complicated uh, uh, data mining models like rendered forest or uh, boosted algorithms. There are a lot of possibilities, and of course, they have to take into account the nature of the data. If you have presence and absence data, you need other models and you need abundances. This I will also not touch because it's a very complicated field and the field uh, by its own. I only think what we need always, if you make such models, we need 
um, say good ways or, or appropriate ways to identify the appropriateness of the models. And I will use here what I uh, 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 what, what, what you can call predictability. Simply predictability means how accurate is my prediction of data uh, from the statistical models. And this predictability means that I have to divide almost my sampling data in two data sets, the training data set where I test the statistical models, and a test data set where I predict what I what I predict to see because of my later data and what I found uh, uh, using my data uh, from uh, the field sample. And most of my examples now about about LIDA coming from a project in the national parks at the very uh, national parks at the same national park which I already mentioned is the Cape Kelly and this is in the south east of Germany it's is Germany uh, Frankfurt is somewhere here Munich here Berlin is here here is the national parks and here we have the area of the national park and in this area we have several transects and along these transects we have 200 sampling blocks and into sampling plots or um, sampled insects, spiders, uh, birds, or whatever, all with the appropriate sampling distance. Of course, we have now data of LIDAR along, uh, along this whole area, especially along the transect. In this sense, in this project, the LIDAR were acquired with an area, with a, with a, um, a helicopter, and the footprint size was about 20 centimeters is 11 reflections. So we have a very, very detailed information of the vegetation. And to compare, it, and that's a important point with such, such studies, we wanted to know how good is LIDAR. We have, of course, compared LIDAR with other variables. And to compare it, we made several field measurements, aerial photographs, uh, uh, to compare these LIDAR models with models using other environmental variables. And if you only an impression of what, what you get, these are one hectare to one hectare plots. For example, for birds, it's an appropriate plot size. Here you have open stands, and you have the canopy height estimated from LIDAR. Here you have mixed forests, different forests with forest gaps. We have mature beach forest that you can see uh, again here the height. So you get very clear, very uh, detailed pictures about the habitat structures. And here it's a little bit of a complicated, a complicated uh, table. Um, what we did is we derived from LIDAR one, two, three, four, five different measures of habitat, so canopy height, the standard deviation of the canopy height gives you some indication about the roughness, how deep is the canopy between species, um, maximum height, and also the penetration rate, or the, uh, how, how often uh, the, the, the beam reaches the ground, this gives you some information about the bush cover. Then we made other big measurements, for example, number of trees, snacks, here that is uh, dead trees, age of the oldest trees. This were done by field measurements. And you see the environmental situation in the, in the Bavarian measurement of the park is quite rough, and it's not easy to make the field measurements. And we also did various photographs. And the point is, try not to extract too many metrics out uh, of um, uh, the LIDAR so they have a fair uh, comparison of statistical models between the three data sets. I only want at the first, uh, first note that you look here at the skewness and the courtesies. It's almost, almost zero. When you look here, you have 36, you have 5. So they are, from a statistical point of view, well behaved and statisticians will be happy with such data. So they have, from a statistical point of view, a very good behavior. With these aerial photographs you see as students, they have not. And even with the field measurements, they have also not. Um, and uh, um, another important point is the different measurements are not directly connected. It's for it matter, I have to correct. Uh, uh, when you measure, for example, here, from the habitat from aerial photographs, you get here's the square meter, so the amount of young broadleaf forests between zero and six meters. So it's a square meter. For canopy height, it's a length, so it's 
So it, at least the dimension already shows that the data have complete dimensions and are loosely connected. But, and therefore, the pairwise correlations between data sets. So when you grasp one, one variable from one data set and another variable from the other data set, you get no correlations between zero point, below 0 0.5. But you can also make canonical correlations. What is, you make linear combinations of your LIDAR data and in such a way that you maximize correlation with a linear combination of uh, the uh, other data set. And then you see here the canonical rules for field measurements here for every photograph against LIDAR. And then you uh, immediately see that you have very close correlations when you use, uh, say, multivariate representations of this data which are above 0, 8. So you have both data set also have complete different dimensions capture more or less the same environmental information. Also do not know uh, which types of information it is. That's the reason why a LIDAR model, a modeling biodiversity is LIDAR, is phenomenological. So we have no idea about the process there. And another important thing is, which I want to mention here very shortly, is LIDAR is very uh, cheap compared to field measurements. If you have to, have to send out researchers for months into the forest to measure tree height, it costs you something like 300 to 100 euro uh, uh, per hectare in Germany. When you, when you want to have LiDAR data and you, and you order a, a company, then it must be something like 10 euro per hectare and for processing, processing the data, also 5 euro per hectare and so the, the costs are below 15 euro per hectare, so it's a big difference. LIDAR is cheap and, and collects meaningful data um, um, like other species. Now let's go to our, let's see, let's look at our first results. It's from biodiversity. Um, this normally is features rich, but I will use here a very broad definition of biodiversity. I want to predict the abundance of bird species. So this point is the predictability, the predictability of bird species uh, measured as per square. So people who have some ideas about statistics know what I mean. Uh, 200 or from 200 or 220 data plots, we had 100 for, for uh, uh, training and 150 for testing or something like this. And this gray band gives you uh, the uh, Confidence limits for the predictability to do with a random partitioning between training data sets and we rank species according to predictability. And the first thing what you observe is that the predictability of abundance of individual species may be around 50%. It's high from a statistical point of view, but maybe low, but it's low because 50% are not explained. So 50% are explained. And for some species you can explain very well. Other species, you have no chance. Predictability of this species is almost zero. And the point is, the other graphs here are predictabilities calculated for the other data sets. We use these field measurements, this area for the photographs, and we also use space. That is the reason why we have three, uh, three lines here. And you see that the ranking is almost the same. So that you that we are not able to predict certain species by LIDAR is not the fault of LIDAR. It has something to do with the natural history of the species. So we are not able to predict everything and it has nothing to do with LIDAR. And at the end of the talk, I, well, from the biology point of view, it would be very interesting to understand why this is so. And to predict why some species are not predicted, to predict the predictability, that would be a nice, that would be a nice thing. And to show you that the pattern is almost the same, it's almost the same for insects. We did the same exercise here for spiders. We ranked spiders just, uh, uh, according to predictability with slider. And here only plotted uh, ground survey data for the spider. And again, you see the ranking is almost the same. And some species are easy to predict. Also, again, is a predictability about 50, 60 percent. In some species, we have no chance to predict that all predictabilities is roughly uh, uh, a zero. This has nothing to do with abundance. We used only species with a sufficiently high abundance for modeling. So 
what we modeled here, abundance. Of course, you can also not model abundance, you can model even higher levels of abundance. Here we did it for soundness from flight interception traps. These are these funny, funny traps where the animals fly in or fall or, or, or hit the glass and fall into smile. And you can also use pitfall traps as a simply fall, these animals crawling around. And what we have done here is we looked at the percentage like I can explain from other uh, environmental problems. But first, have a look at this here. When you want to model the overall abundance of insects trapped with spitfoil traps, this LIDAR, you have only 10% richness, much below 10% uh, predictability, diversity, only 4%. And here it's mean body size of the species uh, which have fallen into the trap. Predictability is much higher here, 20%. So there are some characteristics of communities, communities on the surface, which are not able to predict. Nevertheless, this small amount of predictability is almost always due to LIDAR data. So LIDAR capture much more. If you have little chance to predict anything, then LIDAR is almost the best always. From these 3%, Almost 100% are covered by LIDAR. And when you look at flight interception traps, the predictability is much higher than the predictability for info traps. And again, LIDAR is almost, uh, covers a lot of the information. So the point is, we can predict abundances of some species. We can predict uh, several diversity measures. But we have not always, we have not, uh, not for every uh, information we have, not for every collection, not for every metric we can extract from, from the assemblages. And that's an important point when somebody wants to use uh, LIDAR data. We need ground using, we need biodiversity data to uh, check our models whether it's possible to map biodiversity with uh, these points. And of course, we can even get a step. Next step. The first was that the first with these decrease in predictability was abundance of individual species. The last slide was about biodiversity data, about species richness, individuals. And what we have here done is we modeled the whole community matrix. There are possibilities to model the whole matrix, so the abundance of each species within each uh, site. And I want to make it short. The first point is here you can model something about 20% of the variation within such community matrices uh, using environmental data at all. That's a rather high value. And this is a randomization test that shows you that the environmental data we have at hand at least uh, explains something. So it's not to see it's much higher. What we have here, here, we have the unique contribution the unique contribution of LIDAR data to this 20%. So from this 20%, 21% is only captured by LIDAR. And LIDAR has a lot of, so it captures also some amount, we have not shown yet any connection, some amount of Celsius. So LIDAR captures about 50% of the information which is also present in aerial photo photoshops. So the message, overall message of this quite complicated graph is simply that LIDAR has a, well, a good performance uh, or a good contribution to the overall predictability. If you can predict something, the LIDAR is almost the best. But we still don't know what we can predict. And of course, it's no need to go into details here anymore. This predictability here is the same graph as the last one, but it's a different, uh, different design. And for you to look here at LIDAR, the unique contribution to the predictability of LIDAR is more than 20%. So what, what this graph shows you is that LIDAR is well, a successful tool to find, uh, to predict some biodiversity uh, and some type of. Um, now we, we have only modeled, we have only modeled um, um, the community composition, we modeled diversity, we modeled abundance, but, but we can also model, of course, habitat structure. And even in this very subtle way, um, for example, the Bavarian foreign, or we must explain a little bit more, we have in the European community launched a program which is called Natura 2000. 
these are habitats under special concern, and the states within the EU have to, well, to provide information about the distribution and the, the quality of these habitats in the areas under that care. And the national parks, and primarily for the national parks, has some, is also Natura 2000 sites, and has quite a number of habitats which under the concern of which is some conservation concern. These are especially beach forests, there are two types of beach forests, and of course we have the spot woodlands, and these pine forests are on the forests on, on acid sites. And because beach has a different appearance than pine, it should be possible to, to classify habitat simply by using lighter data, simply by using how uh, uh, the, the points are distributed. And uh, this we have done here in a very simple way. We have here the four different forest communities coded with different colors. The points are the different plots. And <coughs> these are the linear discriminant analysis to separate, to separate the different communities. And you see that compared to vegetation, relatives, relatives that's a classical uh, procedure, a classical method to classify habitats and go out, you measure or you estimate the cover of the species of bird in the habitat, then you classify the habitat. Of course, it's very clear that you can uh, separate the various habitats, the various the four types of forests. When you look here, with the LIDAR data, you see that you can also separate the things, but some of them are not easily separated. For example, two beach forests are difficult to separate with LIDAR, this, you see they are overlapping, uh, this integrate or overlapping uh, within the systemic discriminant functions, suggesting that it is not possible to use this. But the next step again is making a good, making a fair comparison. And this fair comparison is that we need a test data set and a training data set. And we do this test in the training data set can here measure the overall accuracy, that's only compared either. So the overall uh, accuracy assigning a special plot measured by LIDAR to a habitat type is 70%. When you do it with this vegetation data, which appears very good in a discriminant analysis, when you do it in such a kind of a, of a data where you, uh, in a process where you divide the data in a training data set in the, in the in a test data set, then that's, you have a much lesser accuracy slider. So vegetation data are a bit optimistic in assigning habitats to uh, assign relatives to special habitats. So again, LIDAR is a cheap choice to get a reasonable estimate of the distribution of habitats in, in uh, such an area. And perhaps somebody might have the idea uh, okay, if LIDAR is not the best what we can achieve, perhaps we can combine LIDAR with other remote sensing methods. And recently, we have um, uh, uh, systems are available like hyperspectral data. So you, you collapse the reflectance over 1,000 different uh, uh, spectral bands and then use the reflectance of these different spectral bands for predicting species richness. And you have only here, very, you can here have a very simple look at, and you look at richness of plant species now, and because the reflectance of plant species is much closer than the reflectance for the habitat of an animal, so when you look here at the richness, LIDAR gives you uh, accuracy or predictability of 30%, and hyperspectral data, 8%, and if you combine both and you hope that it gets better, it gets, it gets worse. And the same is here, then you look not only at the richness, you look at the composition, so you want to model the whole community matrix. LIDAR gives you accuracy for, for plants is 75%, and it's almost the same as hyperspectral data, which are much more expensive. Combining them gives you a little bit more information, but you have to think about whether it's worthwhile to invest as many to combine the two methods. So the point is, and I hope to have uh, uh, convinced you that LIDAR provides 
interesting or information which is meaningful, even in the sense of, of, of or in the, the view of animals, of course, of, of the vegetation is much easier. And but I have hopefully also convinced you that um, this is a magic bullet. You cannot predict everything. Now the question is, can we predict something about predictability? So you see, again, this is true for spiders, again, this is for, for birds, for abundances, so the predictability decreases. Some of them you cannot predict, some of them you can predict quite well. You cannot predict, you can predict this species quite well. It doesn't matter the species is not. So why differ species in their predictability? That's an interesting point that is insofar interesting because the predictability is almost the same for all data sets, irrespective of whether you're using LIDAR, you're using ground-based data, uh, or whatsoever. So what is this predictability perhaps a trait of species? And um, I want to present earlier, now it becomes much more complicated than, than it is was already. Um, when you want to look whether um, whether something is a trait which has some importance in evolution, then you look the evolutionary signals, what is called phylogenetics. You can a simple a simple trait which shows a glow or a clear phylogenetic signal is, for example, body size. Uh, all ungulates are large, and all rodents are small. So uh, body size is not when you have a phylogenetic tree. Body size is not randomly distributed along the phylogenetic. And here we see analysis of body size for the bird species. Um, and 20 years ago, somebody developed a metric which can be used to capture uh, the phylogenetic signal. And this is called Bajan's lambda. It's between 1 and 0. It can be even a little bit above 1. 1 means a, low, uh, a, a high phylogenetic signal. And none means a low phylogenetic signal. And these bird trees, you can get now, you can retrieve now from the internet, you can retrieve now even, say, samples of trees which integrate uh, uncertainty in the, in the estimate of the phylogenetic tree. When you sample 100 trees, you get this distribution of Bayes lambda, which are all individually significant and overall in the range of one. So it's clear that's only to show you that it's a good, that's a good a measure for, for a trade that shows a good phylogenetic signal, it's almost one. And now, when you look at predictability, the R squared, for the R squared between, for the abundance of species, they get also the predictability around one. It means that predictability has a phylogenetic signal and species are, which are, can be predicted are closely related or related and species which cannot be predicted are not related. It does not mean that predictability because it was my, 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 my statistical model which generates the predictability said that predictability is entrenched in the genetic code of the species. This only means that predictability is correlated with some traits which might be a high And we did this already to give you an impression we are not uh, saying the analysis of some complicated questions has not really proceeded very far. Um, and we have not really now no, not really, <coughs> no real uh, idea what might be the traits in words which influence predictability. But for spiders, we got some information. For example, here we predict, here we plotted the predictability against female body size. So it's not a very good correlation. And you can uh, plot predictability against abundance. You might have, you might see, uh, you might have a feeling that common species are much easier to predict than rare species. Not a good correlation. But where we found a very good correlation is in each position, according to shading. There are, in, in, for European spiders, there are data banks where species are ranked or get certain uh, values for the ranking along a gradient between 
open and closed evidence or between moist and dry evidence. For, the, uh, for this moist dry evidence gradient, you get a lot, you get no correlation at all. But when you look at, at uh, shading this, that species living in open habitats, it's easier to predict sea species than species living in closed habitats. We have at the moment no idea at all what is the reason for this, but this is the first signature that you have to look into the natural history of species, natural history of species to understand why but why a predicting biodiversity by LIDAR is sometimes successful and sometimes not successful. And I can not only um, um, put too much emphasis on this, using LIDAR by itself for biodiversity research is nonsense. We need always a ground truthing. A ground truthing which involves people which know to deal with biodiversity. This taxonomy. That's always an important point uh, to take this into account. Um, that's my six, I think, six take-home messages, messages I want to, to give you uh, on your way home. That is, first of all, hopefully I've convinced you that LIDAR provides fine-grained information about the habitat and information of the vegetation structure which uh, uh, captures features of the habitat and that this information is almost the same of the information you can collect on the ground. So you have a chance to get detailed uh, information of the vegetation structure from the air, uh, uh, from the air, simply from the air. This information can be used in some cases to model biodiversity, but the performance or the predictability of these models differs considerably between species. It differs between assemblages and even uh, between the composition of assemblages. So we have always to test out which species we can really, or which communities we can really predict this life. And it would be a real um, step forward further that we can predict this predictability. And the point is that these variations between species, between communities, even between sampling systems, is not the fault of LIDAR because we saw this uh, uh, variation and predictability also in other data sets. So it has something to do with the natural history and therefore, oh, okay, therefore this hypothesis to predict predictability uh, must be founded in natural history and that's of course my thing. It's a little bit hard as a biologist to say that all of us biologists have to be involved in remote sensing, in remote sensing projects to predict uh, uh, biodiversity. And this is the end of my talk. I hope I have gave you some information for to take home and for some thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Brandon. So it wasn't time, no? Yeah? Okay. Yes, yeah, the uh, floor is now open for your questions, comments, Please use the microphone located along the aisles and can you introduce yourself and the organization you are currently connected with. So who will shoot the first question? Obviously I get everybody here. <laughs> yes. Um, can you introduce yourself? Good uh, afternoon everybody. I am Forrester Gundola. I came also from this uh, university. My question is with regards to reflectance. Uh, some times ago when I was uh, assigned in the Cordillera Mountains, we have problems with reflectance. Uh, the colors of pine trees resemble the colors of chayote plants. That's why in determining the density of the forest system, there was, turns to be erroneous because of the problem of reflectance. Is LIDAR truncated some kind of problem or some kind of problem? No, the point is, you measure not 
color. You measure only it's a reflectance itself. So you measure simply uh, uh, the, the form of, 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 the, of, the, of the presentation and not the color. Of course, you can measure now this kind of hyperspectral data. You can measure now in very detailed the color. Uh, and I'm sure you find this even you use nowadays to separate exotic species from non-exotic species because you can use hundreds of different bands and you get five different of the color. It was impossible years ago. LIDAR has nothing to do with color, it has only to do with structure. Also the point? You mean Lighter is not only for color. It's nothing for color. It's but the structure of the, say here, trees. But sir, if you observe, have you been in the north also? There are plantations there that are what we call vegetation, plantain, uh, vegetable plantation like Sayone. Intercrop with uh, fine trees. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when we do some remote sensing in one of the studies there, we found out that uh, it's uh, the density of the uh, trees is still uh, very good because of the reflectance also coming from uh, the Sayote plant, which is a big, uh, vegetable type, and uh, the Benke pine tree, which is three species. What, 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 so what, what do you mean by structure? Uh, Lighter defines the structure of the, uh, say, color tree? No, no, no. It would define you the height of the vegetation, it would define you the variation of the height, it would define you the cover of the bushes, it would define you the cover of the ground vegetation. It will never distinguish by itself between exotic and non-exotic species or whatsoever. Uh, it will also get only an overall estimation of the structure. That's the reason, and I, I already told you that that's the reason why I wanted to be always that, that people are careful in using LIDAR. They have always to think about for what use you want to make LIDAR and for predicting uh, or, um, or which aspect of biodiversity which species you want to make. For some, you might have no chance at all. For some, you might be very good. And of course, foresters, if they only want to measure trees, want to get some estimate of the standing, uh, of, the, of the timber, amount of timber available, they are often very successful. Right? But we want to get, this with, with, with astrologists, I wanted to get a step forward. I wanted to use this LIDAR data to use to get some information about the species living in the tree or even living below the trees. And when we have carefully looked at the, at this comparison between flight interception traps and pitfall traps, when you measure the activity of animals on the ground, pitfall traps, the predictability is very low. So obviously these animals are are uh, regulated by something else has nothing to do with vegetation above the trap. When you put a trap into the, into, uh, the vegetation, this flight interception traps, then you have a rather reasonable predictability. So it obviously has something to do with the behavior of the animals, whether it's possible to predict or not to predict. This with, say, if you are interested in getting species names from the space uh, it, it might be sometimes successful but maybe sometimes not successful it depends really what you want to do any more questions
Uh, what got my intention was that you were uh, you were using the inertial measurement unit. That's not really what's the point. I noticed that you were. I noticed that one of the components of LiDAR was the inertial measurement unit. Yeah. So what I would like to ask is that. Uh, uh, wait, let me clarify that you mentioned that there are also, there are also it was also having difficulties in uh, this and the distinction of the uh, the species, especially exotic and non-exotic ones. So what I I would like to ask is that is it possible to distort the data of lidar by using uh, spatial orientations of the of the of the species or of the lidar? Actually, the, sur the surroundings of the lidar, for example, using optical illusions. Yes, you look at everything uh, combined. But I think the, pro the, the, point, the point is, um, my task was, or my aim was here to find out, or at least to get some arguments, is lidar, does it has a comparable particular uh, uh, performance analysis? Of course, you can always increase the performance as long as you use or combine uh, information uh, from other points of view. The point here is simply what does it cost? Uh, and, 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 the, and, and one argument of LIDAR is, is that that's the reason why it was used in this uh, uh, national park, it's a rough area. If you want to make ground measurements and some more complicated measurements about orientation of, for example, fractal termination of the trees, it's also a possibility to to get this fractal dimension, you have to measure the trees on the ground. And then all the advantages of LiDAR are gone. You have to go into the field, you have to do field measurements, and it makes not really sense. The point is, uh, LiDAR is cheap, that's the reason why it's getting cheaper and cheaper. Uh, you have even companies which can be, uh, which are doing the job for selecting the LiDAR information for you. And that's the reason why you can use uh, LiDAR to predict something in space. But you have to also be aware, if you want to understand why the predictability works, you need additional information. Then you are open to everything. Thank you, sir. Sir, I am Ivan again. Hello. I am from the LiDAR team. So, uh, we are in Philadelphia. Like, we are using uh, laser pulses. So we are using two points per square meter. In your study, how many points are in less than the twenty centimeters? So ten to twenty centimeters. Every twenty to twenty. Uh, so that is one square. Uh, one square. Centimeters. So how many points? Per ten. Ten. So it's a map. Since it's a really fine grain laser. Because some of my uh, colleagues here are asking if they can study about uh, lower level of light, lower levels of light orbits. So we are just using two points per square meter. So Perhaps you have, you have, you have noticed that Martin it was um, it was not by chance that I presented spiders yeah. and birds because birds perceive the landscape in a complete different scale. So uh, the territory of a bird might be one hectare or something like this, of the small birds. And the spider has only some square meters. So with the resolution I had, I put uh, uh, model for species. Uh, so it, is, it, 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 it covers the scale. But in the case with two, uh, say, two um, uh, how do you call it? responses per square meter, what's the two per square meter? Mm -hmm. two Laser um, two per square meter for birds, it might be sufficient, but it might be not sufficient for uh, uh, species living on a smaller scale. Uh, perhaps for larger insects, it would be also. Okay. Uh, and the other point, what I, what I, what, what I have completely ignored here is when you, uh, it's not only the point or the plot or the hectare where you measure the LIDAR and where you sample the things which are influencing the species. Of course, the neighboring plots are also influencing uh, the biodiversity. So if you want to increase the sophistication of modeling, you can, you can make very complex spatial kernels uh, to include uh, neighboring, uh, uh, neighboring plots or the neighboring area into your models 
can wait uh, information of these uh, of these plots with a distance. Sophistication is is for most statistical models there's no end. The problem is to understand what the models are really doing, or what this is, or as a as a basic ecologist you're often interested, you want to understand which processes influence abundance and distribution of species. And this you have to investigate these differences. Hello, good afternoon. I am Leo, Leo Barua from Makinic Center for Mountain Ecosystems. Um, I understand that you work with uh, animals, arthropods, insects, but in, in your experience, have you uh, used glider data to predict different types of land cover? For example, differentiating forests from other types of land cover, such as. Um, this is simple. Yes. So, are there existing models to to use in order to differentiate uh, those uh, different plants? That's really okay. no problem. Uh, simply, it's not um, uh, distinguishing. Uh, perhaps this is a good example. Uh, let's go back. Uh, what's wrong? 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 For example, here, this uh, this would be a forest. And this is kind of a grassland uh, forest. Because it's a case why this included here is it was a forest. The forest was not uh, uh, removed, died back because of bark beetles attack. attacked. So it is mostly a, a, a grassland. So it's easy to distinguish. Yes. According to those graphs, you're differentiating the different uh, land cover types according to the height of the. You can, you can use every information about variation of height. We have a lot of different possibilities. Uh, extract metrics for doing this. Now, extending that question, do you have uh, have you uh, experience or encountered models to estimate biomass volume of forests using light data? Uh, again, I have you uh, tried measuring biomass volume? No, no. But this is I know I never tried it, but I know from foresters that this. Uh, so to do it or use it routine uh, to estimate biomass uh, from this life. Uh, um, what we are interested in animals, we are animal ecologists. I never used it for estimating animals. But they think there is a possibility. It is, it is possible. So you mean? In Germany, the foresters are using this nowadays uh, almost in every area to estimate biomass. So you mean there should be some relationships between ground data and primary data? All that's always needed. You need, you need to ground use. Yeah? You need always some kind of uh, local ground or local data uh, to calibrate uh, your models. And I'm sure for different forest systems, such calibrations are already available, at least for European forest types, are already available in the literature. Here, perhaps you have to develop it by your own, or you have to borrow it from models from other areas where they have already been developed. Maybe. Yes. Yes. Hello, sir. I'm Vanessa Borja from the um, IPS. I'm a student. And I'm just curious whether um, LiDAR can still detect those um, plants in the understory or those that are um, uh, below the canopy cover, even though uh, there is a high canopy cover, if it can detect density. Uh, it depends a little bit on the LiDAR system you are using and the number of LiDAR shots you are uh, directing to the Earth. There's almost always a chance that at least some of the reflectors, some of the shots, go through the, the tree cover and are reflected by the bush. And that's the reason why you can estimate the tree. For example, here, um, it's a very simple matrix. Here we simply estimate the mean canopy height in meters. You could also measure the penetration rate between 5 and 1 meter. That means how much of these, these uh, shots reach 
sehen ja sie erhält, also sie erhält bei den 105 Meter, das ist ein Prozentage. So, in average, they have here, push this between 105 Meter of 70, uh, about 70 percent. And plants or vegetation ecologists would estimate this as bush cover. And the ground cover here is about uh, 60 percent. So, 60 percent of the ground is between 10 centimeters, not 10 meters, that's round, and between 10 centimeters and 2 meters is uh, uh, ground cover. So we have to get a very detailed information. The point is, don't expect too much. Uh, you can always, always think about what our vegetation ecology is doing. They go out, so looking at a plot, at a homogeneous plot, and they estimate the overall tree cover, they estimate the bush cover, that's the different layers, they estimate the ground cover, and then along a range scale, they estimate the abundance of different here you get at least very detailed information and you can of course adapt this to your needs and this is necessary for, to adapt to these needs. And that's also one of the important things you have to keep in mind. If you have put your LIDAR data in your data bank, you can always extract the data you want. You can reuse it all the time. When you have been out in the field to measure habitat structure because you want to uh, analyze your cats, for example, you have the idea uh, you need bush cover or the number of holes in a tree, and when you are back and you have analyzed, you say, hey, oh, uh, holes are not necessary, I need uh, the fallen trees, and I haven't measured them. So the point is, I have to go back to the field and do the measurement again. But with the LIDAR, at least you can try to extract now new data or a new matrix which might be of use for your purpose. This again uh, makes it cheap. But again, the main point is to expect that we can extract everything out of the system. Okay, thank you very much. No more questions? Uh, sir, final one, yeah, final one. Uh, sir, what software do you use to do the information? Pardon? What software do you use? Art. Everything we do, everything is art. Uh, it's all from art. 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 We do everything. So we analyze almost everything. But normally you get, sorry, normally you get, uh, say, uh, the raw data. At least the height of the reflectance point you get from the company where you hold it. Where you hold it. Uh, uh, the data you should get. If it's a good company, you should get exact locations. Uh, and you should get exact lines. Uh, of the reflectors. Then you can calculate everything. We have one, one, one last question. Last, last question. Uh, hi, I'm Stephen from Coral Reef Visualization Assessment Program. I project. Uh, my question in here is, uh, you showed to us the application of LiDAR in biodiversity <coughs> and it's more focused on terrestrial ecosystem. Can we use LiDAR to survey marine ecosystems? I have no, I must say no experience. I have seen papers which use LIDAR in, to measure vegetation, for example, at, uh, in, in, in channel ponds. So LIDAR, I think, goes a little bit in, uh, into the water. I have at the moment no idea how deep it is, so I cannot, cannot answer it. But you, when you look at the internet, you will find for sure some information. Sorry. Okay, so that wraps up our...